Good all. Uh, myself Prashant Polaria. I work as a UX designer plus product manager. Uh, so that's that's kind of like the designation that I have it. Uh, I'm your session manager today for a lighting session on UX as a career, uh, as a career path. Today, if we look around in the product engineering ecosystem, uh, engineering in India, we, we see that UX is still getting the place it deserves. It's often confused with UI and considered to be an afterthought in most of the organizations. Every day, we use awesome products which provide amazing user experience to us without even, even realizing the amount of work and deep thinking that goes into designing of such a product. In this amazing session, uh, we would like to get into the details of UX as a discipline and what skills people need to develop uh, to make a career in this space and look for when they are hiring UX professionals. With that context, let me invite the session chair, Sri Yunit Krishnan, who is the founder and uh, CEO of Design Ventures, a products studio that is building and helping build the next generation of the products. Recently, he was the country head for user experience at Google India, uh, where the, he spent almost eight years leading the design and development of many products and features. Most fam famously known is the Google Map Maker. His other projects included working in Google uh, Transliteration, Voice, News, and Search. So, Sri, over to you. Let's have a round of applause for Sri. where he's building and investing in innovative uh, software products, primarily the cloud, mobile, and big data segments. Uh, over his 25-year career, um, he's a member of the NASCOM uh, Executive Council. He chairs the NASCOM Product Council and co-hosts the NASCOM Product Conclave. Uh, he's also a charter member of uh, Thai Bangalore, where he launched the Cloud SIG. Uh, he's uh, co-chair and founder of the Penn & Wharton Club of Bangalore, and is a co-founder and co-chair of HBS Alumni Angels India chapter. Uh, please uh, welcome. Uh, Chandra Shekhar, uh, Chandra. Uh, I can't read from this. Sorry, we can't read this. So, uh, Chandra has, uh, is currently uh, the VP of Products and Customer uh, Experience at uh, CommonFloor.com. Uh, prior to that, uh, where he's leading the, the design and the user experience. Um, and, uh, prior to that, he uh, worked at uh, InMovie. Um, uh, he also has consulted with uh, several startups and you know, he provides uh, business and product advices to startups. He's also very popular on the speaking circuit. So that is the stage. Gaurav, uh, Gaurav uh, is a, a senior manager of uh, product design and customer experience uh, at Citrix. Uh, he's a design leader and user experience designer with about 12 years of experience in international design and user research for enterprise and consumer products on mobile, web, and tech, the desktop. Uh, with a broad based education in international design, visual communication, and architecture, uh, he's been privileged to be a hands on contribute to many exciting and innovative products. Uh, currently, a senior Manager product design with the Citrix customer experience team. He works on products that enable users to work and play from anywhere. Please. So 
whether the slides are wrong, so probably your name and your photos wrong. <laughs> okay, can you just go back? Yeah. So, uh, can I just get a kind of sense of the audience? Uh, how, many of, how many of you here are designers? Wow. Uh, product managers? Engineers? Sales, business, wow. Others? <laughs> what are you, please? I just read about you. Okay, great. Okay, so um, how many of you would love to be a designer, by the way? Are oh, you thinking of moving from your current career to a designer career? I mean, is that the count that you see? Wow, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, it pays well these days. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, can you uh, next next slide, please? Um, so, what we thought was that you know we we'll first you know given the uh, kind of audience that we have here, we thought you know we we'll start with a, uh, a very brief for about five minutes of uh, an intro to this whole thing, and then you know we'll move to uh, to our panel. Um, so. Uh, the, the discipline of uh, UX, the user experience, you know, its, or, its origin goes back to all the way to the fifth century in the field of ergonomics, right? And the Greeks were trying to find ways of uh, making things much more efficient, how they could make tools that would make things much more efficient, those kind of things. So it is, it's very, and it's, it's, uh, um, it's said that, you know, um, that there were manuals that were written about how you design certain spaces, you know, in the fifth century. Now going forward, uh, you know, we're jumping like you know, many centuries from there. But uh, you know, one of the first successful stories is about the, the, the Toyota company that pioneered the human-centered production system. Now the whole idea was to create, you know, there were machines and you, you know, machines to manufacture products. But you know, the when the, the interaction between the worker and the machines to create efficiency, but also make it comfortable for the workers to be in that environment. And that's the whole pioneering system, which we call the human-centered production system. And and the the in some sense, one of the uh, the breakthroughs in this whole field was this Rock Spark story about uh, in the 1970s, uh, where uh, a team of engineers and psychologists who were you know building the GUI and who are building the mouse and things like that. And what, which comes to, you know, brings us to why we're talking about engineers and psychologists here, right? So just go to the next slide. So what so the whole story is what is the user experience design? The user experience design is about, you know, it involves a person's behaviors, attitudes, and emotions about using a particular product, system, or service. You look at a product, you're happy, it's all about your emotions, right? So you the empathy that you feel for that and all of those kind of things fall into this. You go to the next one. Now, there are several roles within this. What are the needs of the user, right? So you first ascertain the needs of the user. Once the product is built, can they be used as it is intended? So this is a role of, uh, you know, what we call a researcher, right? So there are usability analysts. There are several roles in there. Go to the next slide. So what are we building and what we are not building? And that's a, that's a product designer, right? And, you know, how does the interaction between the user and the components inside the product, right? You know, how the different components, how do they behave? That is the role of the interaction design. Next slide. How does the product look and feel, right? So that's the role of a visual designer. Next slide. How do we build the interfaces, right? So how do we go about actually building it, right? So that's the role of a UI developer. So this is essentially, uh, you know, the different <coughs> Uh, things. Okay, there's one more, which is how do you describe the product to your users, right? So that's called the content designers, but there are several other names. So this is, you know, the, the way it is put is to kind of like summarize into like five or six different things, right? And there are like for content designers, you can think of copywriters, you could think of technical writers, you could think of all those things. You go to the next one. So which makes it like, you know, very, go to the next slide, please. A lot of these things would happen, right? I mean, when you think of designer, You'll also have to think of what kind of designer you want to be, right? You could be all of these. You could be a, uh, an ex 
expert in one of these, uh, and that's essentially what the development approach would be, right? And then I think we'll go into. So, so when you go hire a designer or you want to be a designer, the fact is there is no one single person who's an expert in all of these, right? So with that uh, sad message, you know, we'll start off. be plainly evident to all of us that you know experience matters more than ever right? uh, you know the out-of-box experience for every product uh, is critical to its success in fact you know I often look at teams that don't have a designer on board or at least somebody who's contributing in a serious way as uh, you know, really handicapped <laughs> because uh, they're not going to be able to put a product together uh, they're not even going to be able to articulate it to stakeholders or investors because a little bit you know you need to sell a dream even if it's a startup right uh, and part of that dream is selling the experience They're like what is it you're going to sell to others and you need to convince people of that so oftentimes I tell people you know and you need to convince yourself too that what you're building is what you uh, you know this is the experience you want to build and deliver and stand by it's going to be your brand uh, it's going to it's going to articulate what it is the value prop you have as a company. Uh, so you know, and the and the world is so competitive now. You're literally one click away from you know being rejected, right? So if my experience on Ola is bad, I'm one click away from Uber. If my experience on Uber is bad, I'm one click away from Taxi for sure. And they're all the three icons right beside each other. Okay, so it doesn't take me a lot to switch. And you know, I, I don't have. You know, it's not like I hate any one of the companies or anything, but there's nothing, you know, I need to cap, I need to get somewhere, and you know, if, if that experience is broken for whatever reason, uh, I'm abandoning quickly, right? Yep. So loyalty is very ephemeral. Uh, you know, out-of-box experience is extremely important as a result. Uh, I think uh, you've got, uh, it's not just UX, it's CX in my mind. It's the customer experience that matters. Uh, and I use customer in a very broad sense because customer, let's say, let's just take one example. Let's take the, you know, what we all know, like the Ola Camps app. It's got many customers, right? When I'm about to order the cap, I'm one customer. <laughs> when I'm sitting in the cab, I'm a different persona. The driver of the cab is also using that app. He's a different persona. So there's so many experiences there. And then there's obviously somebody else who's probably using it too. In the back office, you know, all of that also stuff. The experience of not having to pull out your wallet to pay the cash. Yeah, yeah. so it's a, there's a bunch of dependencies. There's the payments process, there's the cancellation process, there's the remediation process where there's an issue. You know, so it's the entire experience matters, right? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, you know, especially in payments, for instance, with two-factor and all of that, you don't control everything. <laughs> You've got to work within that framework, right? So just to answer the high-level question, I think product uh, design matters more than ever. I think it's an area where we actually uh, lack talent in the country. It's a big gap. Uh, it's hard to uh, for companies to get to a world class level without great design now, you know, fundamentally. And you know, those that get there, it's not it's not a it's not a given that just because you have great design, it's going to be a great product or you know a great company. But you know, clearly those that don't have it will will, will have a much harder time succeeding, right? So, um, so so you've been in, in movie before, a startup that went from like you know uh, crazy growth stage uh, things, and now it's coming through. Um, how much of a role uh, was design at Inmobi? You know, how do you compare the design of uh, sorry the role of design at Inmobi and coming through? And how do you kind of choose what you want? Uh, it sounded like design at Inmobi was largely uh, what I would loosely call uh, the equivalent of an enterprise product. Uh, in Mobi, uh, for those who know and those who don't know, 
uh, as an ads marketplace. It provides liquidity to the publishers, provides monetization opportunities to the publishers, and brings advertisers together so they can reach their target audience. Uh, your primary use cases or users are the publishers and the advertisers. So in that sense, a lot of our design challenges were largely around uh, data, how do we visualize data, reporting, analytics, dashboarding. Uh, how do we have awesome sign-up experiences? Because if you have a lot of sign-up experiences, that just uh, uh, shoots through the roof your uh, user acquisition cost or your business development cost of acquiring those app developers and acquiring the advertisers and so on and so forth. So I think in terms of uh, challenges, uh, it was similar to consumer products, just that uh, the scale at which you're trying to solve this was a completely different beast. As against a uh, common floor uh, where it's equivalent to a B2C product, you have builders, agents, owners uh, who want to either let out their house or sell their house or sell the inventory that they have. And you have uh, people like us who want to buy stuff online. And, and uh, I, I don't think as a market or as a, as a, as a uh, market we are ready to just buy online yet. There have been a few successful experiments, a few not so successful experiments. But uh, just getting that user to that journey from a vague notion that yes, I want to buy a house uh, to culminating in an actual transaction is, is a completely different beast in terms of uh, information, how you visualize that information, more so in real estate because uh, I think Flipkart and, and uh, uh, credit to uh, the e-commerce players, they've reduced that buying process almost to uh, uh, a canned off-the-shelf thing. You know exactly what, how, what to search for, how to search for. You get a, a category or a category page or a SKU page. Uh, you say add to cart. Uh, in real estate, we're trying to grapple our heads that how do we kind of let you know that this unit that you're considering is actually 30 feet away from the boundary wall, which overlooks a fairly filthy uh, nala, if I could use an Hindi word. And how do you provide this perspective to the user who's deciding should I waste my Saturday or Sunday actually traveling out to check out this place or not? So I would say the class of problems is completely different. Uh, equally, equally difficult challenges to deal with. Uh, in terms of structure, in terms of precedence, I would say uh, common floor possibly is a higher order design challenge because no one's cracked it really yet. Uh, so you've been about five years at Citrix, and Citrix has gone through this uh, transformation, if I may, from a pure enterprise kind of uh, player to, in your description, say anywhere, everywhere kind of thing, right? So. How does that affect the role of design in your organization? I think Citrix is an interesting case study uh, where uh, design is playing an even important role uh, now than it was playing about uh, six, seven years back. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, you know, I've been part of that journey um, of making design a very integral uh, part of everything that we do at Citrix. So it's not just about creating products. Design would help, for example, in the way uh, the HR teams work. Um, design thinking has become such a critical notion now um, to help uh, any and every field. For example, finding the value of a new product that's been created, finding the product market fit, for example, and how can design play a role there? So everybody understands uh, you know, the traditional design that happens, the user experience design where you work on a product, you work towards making it really easy to use, intuitive, um, bring in some delight so that people love it. But I think now it's in a phase where uh, design is going beyond um, and affecting every part of the company. Okay. Uh, so, uh, by the way, uh, you know, we wanted this to be uh, more interactive with the audience. So, at any part of time, if you have any questions, just raise your hand and we'll take it from there. Right? Uh, so, uh, usually you see these advertisements which basically talk about, you know, uh, startup looking for rock star designer who can do wireframes and mockups, but also, you know, uh, do our logo and our website and uh, can also code uh, this and that. Uh, what do you think uh, is the problem that, you know, the people who are looking to hire a designer grappling with what the role is or <coughs> is, it, uh, is it something that Expected in the in the nascent in India, right? At least in the, in the, in the nascent. Uh, in, in the yeah. See, you know, uh, it's hard to hire for a designer, honestly, because you know I'm not qualified to judge necessarily as a manager, right? As a general manager of a unit, 
well, who's a good designer and who's not. And I, you know, it's a little bit like, you know, I know when I see a good experience, <laughs> but don't necessarily know how to create it. Certainly, you know, it's not easy to say who can help me create that, right? Uh, so it's a little bit hard to judge. The other thing is, in a smaller startup, you're only hiring maybe one or two people in that role. You know, two is actually quite a lot, right? <laughs> For an early stage startup, you, know, you first, you know, assuming you're trying to hire that first person, how do you judge them? So either you've worked with them before, and over a course of time, you've got a good sense of what the design is, or they come very highly referred, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and that's one way to do it. Or you end up, you know, taking a uh, shot at it, <laughs> in some sense, based on portfolio, based on some other work they've done, uh, you might even give them a project to do and come back with it. And now, if you've got a really rock star person who's done it for, you know, an app that had, you know, 50 million downloads or something, okay, great. You know, that's a that's an easy, easy, easy bar, right, to cross. But assuming you don't have that option, you know, you're just seeing somebody who's done a bunch of apps. Uh, you know, you make sure at least they've designed the experience you're trying to build, because there are so many varied experiences down this. OS platforms, there's device platforms, there's the web and mobile. Uh, you may even have an IoT experience built into your product or your offering. Uh, you may have, you know, is it a consumer product or is it an enterprise product you're building? So those are all things you need to think through the matrix, right? And then make sure you're, you're building, you're, you're hiring somebody who's at least has a, a good proxy experience, right? Uh, I would look for somebody who's inquisitive and has some empathy with the, uh, the customer with stakeholders in the experience, right? Uh, that is actually, you know, reasonably easy to test for if you invest the time. Uh, you know, are they asking the right questions? Uh, are they the kind of folks who can, you know, uh, who can kind of uh, think the next order of depth? <laughs> and you know, and you should you should look for that. Uh, I think you can't just look for cosmetic design because there's information design under the hood. There's efficiency of workflow. Uh, there's interactions on the back end that the person has to understand. Uh, they have to understand, you know, they have to have some principles. So I might ask somebody, you know, what are the principles you have uh, for designing this app? It might be something like, you know, I'm never going to make any functionality more than three strings deep. You know, and I'm going to make sure at any point the user can recover, you know, to a known state. <laughs> you know, can they even articulate that? If they don't even articulate that, then there's a bit of a problem, right? They don't have any framework on which they're building their app. Uh, that, that doesn't mean you can't have somebody who's just brilliant at cosmetic design or something, but then in a larger team, you can have that luxury, where you can hire somebody to do X, Y, Z, very specific role, but on a smaller team, you need to have somebody who can deliver the whole thing generally. And so you need to really make sure you, you hire well, right? And it's not easy, uh, because the founder typically is either hiring a friend or he's he or she is hiring whoever will accept the job because designers are hard to come. <laughs> so that's another problem, which is when you don't have a lot of choices, you compromise, and you know later you do the compromise sometimes, right? Uh, so you know it's it's a it's it's a tough one, honestly. As a general manager, I'm just prepared to to admit I made a mistake if I have downstream, and you know maybe find somebody else, right? If you don't make the right choice, unless I find somebody well referred. So uh, uh, when you do this, these hires, right, when you do, I'm sure you would have gone through like a lot of interviews already and all the uh, How, what exactly do you, you know, look for? Like in, in a kind of uh, uh, kind of example, uh, like, prop, like the example is being like you know, problem solving skills, like you would, you would say, uh, you know, uh, you know. Uh, Principles. Does he understand, you know, the, the how this thing works? Does he understand the information design? But that, can he take on these complex problems? So, so there are several ways you can actually go about doing this. So in your, in your experience, uh, how have you gone through it? But I would also love to hear which was the most difficult position to hire for. Uh, role to hire for, yeah. Uh, I would I would second what Ravi mentioned that uh, this is possibly uh, designers in general and just generalizing all disciplines within design are possibly the most difficult people to hire for. 
I think uh, as as a as a product market, uh, product management was at the state possibly ten years back. It was difficult to get a product manager. It's not that bad now, but design continues to be a challenge. Um, so with that, uh, thing of kind of uh, segue into uh, what at least I look for, and, and uh, I think we as a team are trying to uh, instill this discipline is uh, for uh, design sub functions outside of interaction design. Uh, we usually go by whether they've done it already or in what capacity they've done it. Um, and uh, there are no precedents. For example, the class of design problems that we're trying to solve at Common Floor, uh, there are no precedents. For example, uh, we've uh, recently uh, hired a few user researchers. Now, user research as a sub-discipline is, is fairly new in India, and uh, it's difficult to say that, oh, someone's done user research in the real estate domain, uh, leave alone real estate domain, someone's done user research as a design uh, practice in India. So there, I think we largely go by smarts, what we're seeing, what we're hearing. Uh, I guess interaction design is, if I could uh, pick one uh, uh, discipline within user experience, interaction design, uh, we largely go by smarts. We go by those parts. For example, uh, there was one designer whom I spoke to like two weeks back. Uh, he's not really solved the class of problems that we want to solve, but uh, the, the way he went about explaining how we tackle that problem, the fact that data was sitting right up there, uh, the fact that uh, this designer, interaction designer, was crunching numbers more than actually spending time in sketch or prototyping, uh, just gave us the comfort. The fact that he posted that design was prototyping a lot more, gave us that sense of maturity that if we caught this person and then threw him in an ambiguous state, uh, he would know how to swim. Because at some level, I would, I would say what Ravi is saying, that we're not, as managers, completely equipped to evaluate what could... We can, we can pass an opinion. For example, if someone asks me what is good design, I might have an opinion or two, okay, but I can then decodify that into steps A, B, and C, uh, almost down to an algorithm, possibly not. Uh, so we wanted, or we look for people with spark, people who can come in, people who are making the right noises, uh, who have done their previous work the right way, and have the intellectual horsepower to go figure out a new domain. For example, you throw him from uh, designing, say, uh, Google AdWords experience, to throw him uh, at commerce, or throw him at real estate, throw him at cab services and whatnot. Uh, someone who at least has the intuition uh, to transfer some of that learning to the new role. Someone who has the smarts to pick up the new domain. Uh, because uh, uh, with, with either one of these missing, uh, they will always grapple with, with either the domain or the context or the ability to transfer some of the previous learning. So, Long story short, uh, similar to product management, you look for Spark, you look for data, it's, you look for everything non-visual. And then uh, uh, we've been very lucky in a few, yeah. Uh, everything non-visual uh, then gives us a very good sense that if I throw him an abstract problem, uh, he would treat it from first principles rather than say these are the precedents or this is how I can make it look better and stuff like that. We like to talk about, uh, so we, we talked about researchers, we talked about like one of us like to talk about what the users want and then are they getting what they want, right? I mean, we like to uh, talk about, uh, you know, the, the role of, I think we talked, we looked at the researchers to place in, you know, processes, you know, there, there are several processes that have been around. So most of it has been derived from the software industry, software engineering practices and things like that, right? So, so I think uh, if you're linking it back to the whole hiring thing, I think finding a unicorn is really, really difficult. Uh, though we all want to no, it's not there. care about okay. unicorn, uh, you know, it's it's just impossible today. Yeah. Um, so I think what we need to look at is uh, the composition of the team and what do we want to achieve, what are we trying to build. Um, and I want to, want to differentiate between two specific roles that go in the design team, broader design team, UX, customer experience team. And these are uh, user research and product design. Uh, user research, uh, user researchers generally concern themselves with understanding users. Understanding users' needs, uh, their goals, and the way they do things today. And uh, traditionally the way they do it is that uh, they go and meet a lot of users. Right? Uh, so we have a very well-known process called contextual inquiry, um, where the user researchers are like uh, assistants. Right. Um, or uh, rather, you know, a, a mentor, uh, the user is a mentor, and they're just watching. So, 
they would just go there, sit with them, and not do anything but watch and document what a user is doing today. So, for example, if we link it back to common flow, um, you know, how how do users buy a property today? And uh, if if a company has that deep insight, I think they can leverage it to build awesome products. Um, so that's it's a very critical role. Um, also, something um, as Sandra mentioned, you know, uh, not recognized enough yet. Uh, its value. Um, it's a growing field, growing domain. Uh, traditionally, people come from a lot of backgrounds. Uh, there are uh, they come from a psychology background. They come from a design background, um, and uh, there is you know there are specific trainings that they undergo uh, to be a user researcher. Uh, the other role is uh, is in is design product design, and typically the roles that go under it uh, fit under it are uh, interaction design and visual designers. You know two broad roles. Uh, interaction designers look at the flows. So once we have identified the product that we are building, uh, what does the user go through? You know, so uh, a typical uh, thing that we employ is called wireframes. So this is, a, uh, you know, in simple words, it's a black and white line drawing, right? It's got no colors. It's got no fancy buttons. It's got no uh, nothing that draws your that may deviate your attention from the core purpose of what you want to achieve. Um, and the whole goal of creating wireframes is to simplify the process as much as possible. Um, and again, user research researchers come back into picture because once we do wireframes, then we traditionally take them back to users to validate if you know the flow works or not. And uh, these are called usability studies typically, where uh, we either get a user in the office or again go to their premise and walk them through some of these wireframes. These could be interactive on paper. Um, and once the flow is fixed, then you know that's where the role of a visual designer comes in, in making it look awesome. You know, having having a visual language, a consistent visual language that goes through the product, and then um, sometimes detailing out certain elements, creating the icons, um, you know, having a color theme that goes through, uh, looking at typography. Uh, again. Uh, an area that is undermined quite a lot. Uh, so I would categorize it broadly in this uh, in these particular buckets. Okay. So, uh, so I'll have maybe also the last one, but before that, uh, um, so there are so there is there are these kind of rules that the you know, are just raised, like we're starting from like you know, the understanding patterns, diversions versus techniques. I'm asking you because you said there's no distance to kind of work that they are expected to do. But it's also, you know, one of those things that the other generally need to have is that, you know, I know how it is done before, what work, what didn't work, and kind of things like that. And there are things, uh, and then there are these prototyping and then there's the validation kind. So that generally the uh, kind of uh, stages of the design process. How much of prototyping today, given uh, a lot of the new companies out there are mobile parts? So, how much of prototyping, when you say interactive prototyping, is this is, uh, is huge? I would say, uh, you know, if the question was how important it is, I would say that should be the only way that designers should communicate. Uh, just kind of give people, uh, if I want to wear the product hat for like uh, 30 seconds. Uh, Design is just a manifestation of the collective uh, intent, uh, uh, perspectives uh, of a bunch of individuals. In a startup, it could be a founder, product manager, the head of sales, designer, and so on and so forth. And invariably, a lot of these conversations get stuck in terms of visual aesthetics. Uh, very less attention goes to that when I launch this app, exactly what would be the first screen? What would that splash screen, the visual aesthetics of that communicate about the brand? Uh, what would happen when the app loads up in a zero state? What would be the first thing that the user would see uh, in, in, a, in an app like, say, uh, real estate? Uh, what would you expect him to search? So there are lots of these questions that uh, in, goes into either an endless vortex of like hundreds of meetings. Uh, and we figured out, uh, unfortunately, uh, pretty lately that the best way to cut through all of this decision making and this chaos is just to prototype. And thanks to uh, awesome prototyping tools, 
Uh, I would say uh, going forward, at least uh, conceptually, uh, all of our app feature releases, the mandate to the design team is like within a month or two months, uh, there's no uh, there's no mocks, there's no sketch. It actually has to be a prototype that's installed on our app. Uh, may not pull data from the database, that's perfectly fine, but it should be something that you can touch, feel, fire up uh, on your job, fire up at the bus stop and say, oh, this is how my experience would look when I'm trying that micro interaction and so on and so forth. So long story short, um, I think uh, if you're a mobile first company and you're not prototyping but you're doing it the old school way, uh, don't even bother. I mean, you can like cut that decision making cycle to a tenth if you just quickly prototype and then everyone just plays around with it. And uh, it need not be something that's awesome. I remember uh, vividly six months back, uh, a couple of us didn't have access to the, some of the better tools. We just took pieces of paper, scanned them, used something uh, called pop and just like notionally identified hotspots in the image and you just navigate and it gives you a feel that, oh wow, uh, what we were thinking is actually not going to work in the field when you build the app. And just being able to cut like four months of app development cycle because of this insight is, is, is good. Are you open it to the uh, yeah. uh, question? Any question from the audience? So, uh, uh, hi, uh, I'm Manish Bajpayee. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Ravi Guraj and also rest of the panelists. Uh, so, Mr. Ravi, you might be in your journey with the uh, NASCOM product conclave. You will have come across multiple startups uh, which are happening in Bangalore and across the country. So, where do you think UX as a stream, as a discipline, where does it, the maturity of that as a stream, where does it stand in the country today? And uh, the question for the rest of the panelists is, I want one liner answer from all of you to tell you why a person should go ahead and choose UX as a career history. That's a good question, the second one. Brings us back to our topic. Uh, you know, so I, I, I said this earlier, right? I think it's a big gap. Uh, I think it's an area where many of our product companies don't deliver a world-class experience. Uh, you know, uh, products I see from uh, Silicon Valley that are equivalent in functionality look better out of the box than the same product here often times, right? Now, the best products are looking good here, as good as anything, so don't get me wrong, I'm talking about the average product. You asked me about the landscape, right? It's a big gap because we've got good coders who <laughs> we don't have people who are thinking design. And, you know, I often, you know, I, I know how to use Balsamic, I use Flinto, you know, you just put those two together and I can deliver an app on a phone that has the whole experience. So before I give anything to an engineer, I've already mocked it up myself. Because I'm like, you know, I'm thinking about the product, right? And then you have, that's almost my spec, right, of giving the spec. I, I'm capturing screens from all kinds of apps all the time. But when I talk to founders, they're not doing that all the time. <laughs> they're not thinking design. Uh, they're not uh, impregnating their company with a culture, a design ethos. That's necessary because you know yeah, everybody knows what a great product looks like out of box, right? And you know, and you stick with it. You know, half the mobile app developers I see here, they're excited about you know I got 10,000 downloads, right? But then you ask them how many people are actually using it. There's like maybe 500 using it. How many people used it twice? <laughs> it's like 200. So and then they put a year into this product, right? Four of them, and I'm like. You know, you're not getting there, right? And how come 10,000 downloaded and you know, even the 500, why couldn't you get a few more of them to use it a couple more times? And then they don't have the stats. By the way, design is about want more than anything else now. You know, you got to have an analytics person on the design team. <laughs> you know, it's all about A-B testing various, uh, it's not about how cute it looks, it's about how effective it is. That's all that matters. It's not, you know, it's not how pretty it is, right? Uh, and a lot of people think it's about how pretty does the design look. You know, pretty designs don't win, <laughs> necessarily. Uh, you know, you may think with 2020 hindsight, wow, that's a great design. And you know, you go try to copy it, but you don't know actually what's, it, what's making that an effective design, right? There's a whole bunch of things. It's, it's not necessarily even simple things like, oh, make it simple, remove buttons. You know, this is like, you know, everybody goes, reads this on the web and comes back and like, okay, I'm gonna remove all the buttons. Now, how do you get to the functionality now, right? And so there's a, there's a balance between the richness you provide in the interaction, the amount of information you unveil, how you unveil it, 
contextual matters now so much more than ever. You know, when I open the app, it, uh, how do you show the screen to me? You know, do you, do you do something different the next time I come back to the app, second time during the day? You know, you know my waking day. You know, why, why don't you show some new information to me that's more relevant to what I'm doing? And half the apps, exactly the same screen again. Boss, I'm looking for something else in the product, right? right. It's like, yeah. So, you know, it's like I've just booked the ticket. Now I'm coming back to the, the airline app. It should be telling, showing me is the flight on time. Right? Is the next thing in my, in my most likely question, right, of the app. And it does it. It again presents me the same question of, you want to book a flight? I just booked the flight, you know? Now can you tell me if the PNR is going to work? Can I book my seat? Or whatever it is, right? So I'm saying, like, you know, we need to get that design thinking into the product stream, right? In a deep way. Otherwise, these products, you know, you're just going to be writing a bunch of code that is going to go down the tube, right? More likely than not. So, to answer your question in a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in a summary way, I think it's a big gap. I think we need to fill the gap. You need to get talent. It's actually not that hard to develop the talent. You know, the great thing is, mobile experiences are literally being created for the first time for the newest versions of Android now. So it's not like somebody has a huge lead on you. <laughs> so you could, you could train somebody up on the latest interfaces pretty fast. And you know, I think there's going to be a huge opportunity in mobile only. You know, I know you mentioned mobile first, but I actually think there's going to be a, a plethora of companies. And I, if I were a new startup today, I would look at can I do only mobile only? Why even have a why have a web interface? I'm not. I'm saying don't even do a responsive web anything. Not even for the admin functionality. When I talk to founders, they'll come back and say, you know, I've got this big admin interface. You know, it's got this dashboard. And you know, you've got to ask, what is the purpose of that? You know, if the app just works, if the experience is just delivered, maybe everything's on the smartphone, right? Because everybody's got the smartphone. Assume a smartphone is on everybody's lap or in their palm, always going forward now. Now design your app, right? And that's not what, you know, 500 million more Indians are going to have a smartphone in the next 24 months. 500 million. Now, is that an opportunity or what? That's a continent, okay? Most European countries, the whole of Europe is 500 million. So you know we're going to have a huge population, and they, but guess what? They're not going to have a tablet. They're not going to have a desktop connection. They're not going to have a desktop of any kind. Nothing. Only mobile. <laughs> That's it. It's only the smartphone screen. That's the only screen they're going to have. And if you're going to serve that audience, you're not going to build some other experience for the top five percent. <laughs> I guarantee you, you're going to start building it for the the mass, the middle class that's going to adopt this in a big way. You know, and even for instance, I see many apps in the India context that say I'm targeting India, but even even though it's English, at least make the iconography so it's it's easy for somebody to navigate, right? Because most people can figure out English in terms of even if they can't read it, they know approximately what's going on. You can put a rupee sign, you can do various things, right? So the well-developed apps have that capability, right? Even though they may not have an Indic language version, users are still able to navigate through it, yeah? There's a whole bunch of things like that that we still have gaps for. You know? It's frustrating only because there's so much engineering, good engineering talent that is there. Some of the products are on the cusp of getting there, but lack this little bit of finish right? that they need to have uh, in order to get there uh, you know, over the kind of the edge. You know? I can add a little bit to that, uh, uh, to what Ravi said. Uh, I think design and startups you know, go hand in hand. right? And I think uh, Silicon Valley has realized that uh, there is there are designer design funds now, design uh, they fund startups that have designers as founders. Um, so if you heard of Airbnb, right, Pinterest, these are companies that have been started by designers. Um, uh, there is one fund that's a venture fund that's coming up in India that's going to fund only startups that have designers as founders. So it's a, it's a very critical uh, piece for a startup, I think, for any new or emerging products, even if it comes from an enterprise. Well, I would uh, I would take it differently. I would say that you know don't venture there if you don't have the passion or uh, or, or the uh, you know the interest. I would say. So you wanted a one-liner on what career choice I'd make in UX? Uh, no, 
if I were jumping into it. Why I should develop skills in UX today? Yeah, yeah, so I tell you what skills to develop too. You know, go do immersive design. You know, Google Glasses, Oculus, all of this stuff. I've seen so many in the last two weeks, I've seen some awesome experiences. Okay? And those devices are not yet there in terms of their form factor, but the fact that you can wear uh, a glass, and I know there's lots of people said it in the B2C world, it doesn't work. It's, but I, I'm telling you, there are lots of B2B cases. I saw, for instance, uh, a doctor uh, company here that's, that's using it, where a doctor in the US wears Google glasses, is treating the patient. There's somebody in Bangalore that's transcribing what the doctor's doing, pushing information to the doctor's screen, last reading, last visit, report, all that, and the doctor's conversing both with the patient and with this person in live, real time in, in Bangalore, right? And the whole transcri transcription of the whole interaction is done. As soon as the patient finishes, the doctor looks at it on the Google Glass, approves with a nod, and goes on. I mean, you know, that's a different kind of experience. Think about the same thing where you walk in and you're a mechanic for a jet engine, right? You're just going to be wearing this and you know all the parts, you know what you're looking at, you know the context. You know, those kinds of immersive experiences. I was at Bosch two weeks ago, and they showed me what it would look like when they have haptic controls. So they had haptic controls on the steering wheel, right? And it does all kinds of monkey stuff. You know, you drive a driverless car with all kinds of other controls, right? I mean, there's so many interesting experiences that have to be designed, and none of this has needs Java code, okay? <laughs> you know, the Java code is almost given. We can write that. It's who can build a better experience in, in these areas, right? Who can use analytics better? Who can use sensory data that's coming from instrumentation in, in the environment? Who can use ambient knowledge that's there, right? In the information, location-based. You know, you've got a million sensors on this device, right? It can, it can be listening to me right now. Right? There could be an app there running in the background. It could be sending me some information. It could be sending some other information to somebody else. Right? There's a whole bunch of stuff that's going to happen. Even some of the taxi cab companies are going to be listening in the background on what's going on inside the cab using the driver's phone. Right? And then they're going to make decisions on what the interaction is. Is the passenger asking a question? Is the driver not able to answer? And they're going to try and interject and get into that experience, right? So there's so many uh, opportunities. You don't have to think out of the box. So don't just think buttons and web forms and, you know, that's, uh, that, you know, we're way beyond that in terms of interaction design, right? There's so much that you can become an expert in and become a world expert in because there are no world experts yet. <laughs> that's the great thing about some of these areas. So I am absolutely sold that we need to focus on UX. Now, as a person who is trying to build a career, my question is, what is the ultimate motivation for me? How much money am I going to get in this space if I build my career? Well, see, I, I, I understand people are funding companies which are done by designers, but it's still a far shot. I mean, I am a beginner. I am getting into a uh, design space as a UX guy, attending some training. So what are my opportunities? What am I looking at? How can I build my career? So the money question I'll pass to Ravi, that's his domain, I think. But I'll answer the, you know, the design skills uh, part of it. I think to be a designer, uh, a lot of people actually ask me, you know, you, you guys do fancy things, you know, you guys sketch all day, uh, you guys use nice uh, Mac monitors, I want to be a designer. You know, what, what advice do you have for me? And my sincere advice to somebody who comes to that question is, you know, get a formal education in design. Um, like any other education, I think it builds fundamentals, design fundamentals. And then you can find your sweet spot on, you know, in where you want to focus on. Do you want to be an interaction designer, like Ravi was talking about, uh, you know, doing street cutting edge, uh, uh, working on cutting edge, wearables, for example. Or do you want to be a researcher? Or do you want to focus on uh, visual design? Uh, but I think getting these fundamentals in place is is probably the most important thing. And a lot of people that hire designers also look for these. Right? Um, the other things can always be developed uh, at a later stage. But if the fundamentals are missing, then uh, you know it's it's not going to last very long, I think. Let me take a shot uh, yeah. both questions. So the first one was about why do you want to be how did you uh, your background is in business? Your background is product you're a product manager, so you understand supply demand, stuff like that, right? And how price go up, down, kind of thing. 
So at this point of time, I think designers are paid as much as hosting. Okay, at least uh, well-known companies, uh, probably not at startups, but we could be totally wrong. Startups, I know startups where they have paid designers much much higher than they could ever pay paid engineers. So, if you, but if you are in it for the money, I think this is the wrong profession, right? I mean. No, I, 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 I say that as a designer, you know, been in the business for, uh, in this domain for more than 20 years now, I can tell you this is the worst provision for the money, right? Um, uh, you know this, this, this thing about getting possessed, you know, you become another person. You do this literally every day. Right? If you love doing that, you feel the pain of the users, you feel the pain of the other person, uh, you know, and you celebrate you know, the, the, the pleasure of using something for another person and not even building it for you, right? I mean, yourself, right? You're building it for somebody else. So there is this whole role play that you play, uh, thing. If that is something that, you know, keeps you going, that's something that excites you, then this is something that you should do. This is not math or science in the purest sense. I just want to mention a small comment, okay? Uh, so, I have tried this in the last seven, eight years to take an engineer because that's what you hire from campus, grow him, and try to make him an artist, a painter, a UI designer. It doesn't work, okay? Because that's what you have a Java programmer, C programmer. He has to, and you try to make him creator. More recently, what I've tried is hired sculptors. We hired two people. We were very stuck with this US designing. Nobody was accepting it properly. And we had very mundane sort of designs. So we hired some very good paint guys who were very creative in painting and so on. Right? They were not engineers, not MCAs, not BC or graduates. We <coughs> went to Mahabali from that area, got a couple of sculptors, people who used to do rice grain sculpting, right? Those guys are doing wonderful UX and UI. So I'm just saying the experience creation which you talked about, and even nearer home, unless you think differently, right? That real UX stuff not just an observation. I mean, you just can't uh, train the engineer saying, oh, now you should become an expert, creative UX guy. It will not happen. The general, is, general comment is, you know, some of our teams have to be more multidisciplinary. You know, they're just, uh, you know, sometimes they're very engineering heavy. <laughs> and We're just getting to the end of the session. Please use this number to vote your feedback around the session. Uh, let's uh, just give a missed call, dial one of the number based on your choice. Uh, so we'll go ahead with the questions. So probably you can pick up uh, one of the good questions from the audience that they ask. So we'll just give a gift to them. And any question that you feel is or was not as good. So best question will get to you. Should I give the yes. I mean, I think we should give it to, to the question that has the longest answer. <laughs> 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 so yeah, it was Manish. I'm, I'm the <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> you were the only one who asked the question. It's fine. It's fine. Good question. Questions? Next, uh, I'd like to have uh, Pallavi. Pallavi from Cisco. Okay, probably she's busy. Yeah, okay. Ask uh, you to give uh, honor of a chairperson.